I'm your host, Kelly Johnson, and welcome to Women at Iowa, a place where the University of Iowa community can come together and take pride in the accomplishments of the women who call it home. Our guest today is an internationally acclaimed musician. Her experience ranges from piano to conducting an opera. She's also one of the first American women to have been named Kabelmeister. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Pretty close. Or conductor in Europe. So please join me in welcoming our own Sherry Rhodes. Sherry, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Kelly. What I think is most interesting about you is, so you've been, you were born in Idaho, in yes. Boise, Idaho. Another agricultural state. Exactly. And then you went to Southern California for school. Right. And then you went over to Europe and practiced music. And you've basically been around the entire planet. So what brought you here to Iowa City and to the University of Iowa? Well, um... That's the loaded question, of course, <laughs> I thought would come later in the interview. Uh, what brought me to Iowa, um, my husband and I adopted a wonderful um, child. Her mm -hmm. name is Lily, mm -hmm. and I know that you know Lily mm -hmm. very well. <laughs> and we were not happy with the school system, the private school system in Switzerland where we were living at the time. And so we both blew up our careers, blew up our lives, and decided that we would take Lily back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And the first job that was open was the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the elementary school education was ranked number two in the nation behind St. Paul, Minnesota. Ah, okay. And since my husband Jeff is from Minnesota, he said, Iowa, that sounds like a good place. And I actually needed to look on a map to see exactly where that was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've heard some people actually get Idaho and Iowa confused, that Iowa is the great potato state. And <laughs> yes, I have to endure many agricultural jokes whenever I go on vacation to visit the family or come back here. So. Actually, the Iowans are much nicer about the Idahoans than the Idahoans are about Iowa. Okay. I have to say that. <laughs> that makes sense. So where did music start for you? When, when did this become something that you were going to do for the rest of your life? Well, I th that's a very in interesting question. I think most people, when they're children, they don't really know what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And also, the idea of a vocation right. uh, it, it tends to take two paths. Uh, the vocation is supported academically, you know, if you, you want to be a doctor, mm -hmm. then you know that you're going to be doing math and sciences, etc. Right. And as a musician, we had a very rich uh, community um, involvement in the arts, and mm -hmm. so I started at an early age playing the piano, which I absolutely hated. <laughs> I hated to practice. I hated everything about it. I hated to go to the lessons. Um, I was right there too. <laughs> I think most kids are. Um, but they saw something in me, so the teachers and my mother um, kept pushing me forward, and I actually fooled them all by uh, sight reading. So they thought that I was practicing, but I would go through the books, and I learned to read it as, uh, as another language, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons I think that um, this girl from Idaho went on to make an international career. I made a career with the ability to read music at sight instantly with no mistakes. And so I think that was my saving grace as an adult. That's incredible. Yeah. I can't imagine yeah. that. And you have a brain for languages. How many languages do you speak? Five. 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 Yeah. That is incredible. Well, <laughs> Kelly, you know, if you're living in a country and you don't speak the language, you do have problems. So I think, and part of mine too, um, in contracts, in the music mm -hmm. world will often say that you have to speak at a certain level or you're fired. And so it's mm -hmm. sink or swim, basically. Right. So don't be too impressed. <laughs> <laughs> now, where was the first country that you went to when you went abroad? Um, it was interesting. Reaganomics hit, mm -hmm. and I was in Southern California, and then I got a marvelous opportunity to go to Spain. So I went mm -hmm. to Barcelona, and it's kind of a crazy story mm -hmm. how the whole thing happened. Okay. Uh, I had a good friend who was a very famous tenor, and he loaned me his apartment, and I knew absolutely no one in Barcelona, neither did I speak any Spanish. And they actually don't speak Spanish in the streets, that they speak Catalan. So um, I thought that I had a job, because I had auditioned, mm -hmm. and then the man who hired me, he had a heart attack and died, and he never wrote down my name or that I was coming. Oh my God. So I actually moved to Spain, sold everything, and thought, here's my big chance. Yeah. And it was fall, and nobody knew who I was at the theater. So I decided to take that time and to practice the composers that I was always told that I would not do well with, which mm -hmm. was Mozart and Schubert, which is kind of my métier now. It's very interesting, <laughs> typical, right? So I had this apartment that opened up onto the courtyard of the Ritz Hotel. Mm -hmm. 
very beautiful. And I saw what the opera, I, I spent the whole winter practicing, doing scales, all those things that you can't do in music school, mm -hmm. and really learning to be a musician. I worked a little bit, I barely ate, you know, that kind of bohemian existence that you, it's typical when you're right. young in Europe. And those were the days post Franco, where we didn't even have to have visas or working papers or insurance, it was all really loose. You could go in and out the borders. So one day uh, I was practicing one of the pieces they were going to do in the opera mm -hmm. and someone knocked on my door and I didn't really know anyone and I answered it and it was an agent who said that the conductor of the opera lived at the Ritz Hotel and he kept hearing his pieces being practiced across the courtyard. No way. Yeah, because the windows are open, it's warm, right? And so that's how I got back into the theater and that's how the whole thing began. That's very... Yeah serendipitous. And my first <laughs> rehearsal, believe it or not, where I didn't really know what to do in an opera rehearsal, mm -hmm. it, there's, it, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing how that all happens, was with Placido Domingo. And so I just said, what do I do? And he said, I'll teach you how to do this. And they taught me something that was so absurd. They told me a wrong piece of information. And it also gave me probably my second greatest talent. So that was through a little bit of a lie. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. So when you were... Um, so you're in Spain. Mm -hmm. Now, did you stay in Europe until you came back to Iowa? Were yes. You? So you're... Yeah, 20 years. Wow. We went country to country and then finally ended up, um, I went from Switzerland to Germany mm -hmm. and that's where I started conducting. Mm -hmm. And then when I tried to go back to the United States, but uh, the state of opera was, uh, wasn't really what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, I really believe in true theater. Mm -hmm. when not this old convention of opera. You know, when you think about Mozart, you think about, most people think about the little powdered wigs and the right. little short pants, and mm -hmm. I absolutely hate that. <laughs> I, I can't stand it. Yeah. Mozart is this amazing composer who makes us all look at contemporary issues between men and women, mm -hmm. between uh, uh, marriage, uh, in, uh, women in society, men in society. Uh, it, it's a really amazing thing, and it should only be done in contemporary times. We, we have to update it. So I was very used to doing German theater, which is very experimental and really cutting edge. And I, you know, loved doing that. And to come back to America and have this very conventional, what they call park and bark, where yeah. you park yourself on the stage and you bark out at the audience is uninteresting not to me. Not what you wanted no, to do. No, not at all. What's your favorite opera? Oh. <laughs> is that a loaded question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite opera, uh, if I were on a desert island, kind of who would I take? Sure. Or my favorite opera. <laughs> oh. My favorite 20th century opera. So there's really three. Three? Okay. I, if I were three. on a desert island, I would take Handel. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hands down. And then just have an, it just, it's this, it's like a balsam for the soul. Mm -hmm. But Mozart, I love Mozart. I love Mozart. Mm -hmm. I would have to say, um, Marriage of Figaro, which people are probably thinking, what? But it's just eternally interesting. Right. Magic Flute I always love. Um, and probably my favorite 20th century is Lulu from Alban Berg. Okay. Yeah, about an amoral woman. Very interesting. <laughs> In praise of unruly women. Yeah. Um, now I have another question for you. There's something interesting that we, we talked about the other day um, and how you actually came to be a conductor in Germany. You lied. Lied. Yes, I did. Uh, it's a great family tradition. I, we found that my um, great-grandfather said that he was a doctor in the Confederate Army. He actually was a soldier that went AWOL and went out to Idaho. That's how we arrived via mm -hmm. Iowa, I might say, <laughs> which is a very odd part of my history, too. And he just... Uh, seems to have started operating and treating patients with no experience. So mm -hmm. I figured, I knew how it went. I had worked in opera. I'd, I'd been at a, the highest level of accompanying all these famous opera mm -hmm. singers. And I'd, I'd been in the house as a, what they call a maestra interna. Mm -hmm. That's um, an assistant conductor. Mm -hmm. But I had never stood in front of an orchestra in my life. So I took this job in Germany. I left my career in Spain mm -hmm. with all these famous people. And went to a small house. It's considered a, it was a very good house, B house. Mm -hmm. And my mentor was this famous Mozart 
expert, Hans Trevans, mm -hmm. who was one of Schulte's, um, Georg Schulte's assistant. So what happens, they, I said, I will take all of this information I have working with mm -hmm. singers, and I will give you fantastic productions if you will allow me to conduct. And he said, fair enough. So all of a sudden, I had to conduct a Haydn opera. And I, did, I stood in front of the mirror for a couple of months, mm -hmm. and I memorized every note and every articulation, every word. It was in German. And they throw you in front of, in a performance in front of the audience. You walk out as if you've done it every night of your life. The difference with me was is that I had not only never conducted that piece, I had never ever conducted an orchestra. <laughs> so I do, I do remember there was one a little, little meltdown. We call it train wreck. <laughs> but um, the, the idea is that you sink or swim. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, if you, if you, if you have 95% success, mm -hmm. then you're going to catapult your way through a career. Uh, I had probably a 75% success, but it was mm -hmm. enough for, for me to do the second performance and then the third and then to get the next opera. Yeah. And that's what they do in Germany to the young conductors. Mm -hmm. But I d will say, and I know you asked me this, mm -hmm. um, I did have a colleague who was a man mm -hmm. and he was given so many chances and he had probably a 10% success story. But he was paid more than I was, and he had more, more opportunities with the orchestra. And mm -hmm. so as a woman conductor in Germany, as a woman, American woman, it was not fair, and it was pretty terrifying every day of those three very long years yeah. that I learned my craft. I can imagine. Yeah. And now you had also said that, um, was, I don't know if it was this particular position, but there was one position that after you left, they hired two men to take your place. Yep. Two. Two places. Mm -hmm. So that makes me wonder, was I overworking? Was I showing I can do it because I mm -hmm. was a young woman? Right. And to, in order for them to fill the void of all mm -hmm. that work, they had to hire two people. I think that's probably what it was. Yeah. You know, I don't think I was some great stellar talent. I think I just worked 24-7. And my contract actually was a seven-day contract. They can do that in Germany. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, 52% taxes, more than men, because I was a single woman and was not considered a breadwinner. So they have, so do they still have that policy for women? That I don't know. Mm. That I do not know. But at the time, okay, and we had talked about um, earlier, you had mentioned some stuff about women's liberation in, in Germany, and you were kind of there at, at, the, at the peak of that or um, kind of at the, the cusp of women's liberation. Was that challenging? Uh, well, I, I think there, Germany was very different than a few years later in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany had quite a difficult time post-World War II for, this guilty, for the guilty conscious mm -hmm. that, that uh, I think pervades the whole society. And it's better now, but right. uh, women, also began to have much more of a voice and mm -hmm. minorities, you know, we had many um, immigrant workers that came from Turkey mm -hmm. and they're called Gastarbeiter, guest workers. Mm -hmm. And that was beginning, to, we were starting to see the second generation. And so it was a really exciting time because I was there when the wall came down also. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing because we were um, outside the theater I, I was at, it was at Darmstadt, outside mm -hmm. of Frankfurt. And when the wall came down, within 24 hours, all these crazy, uh, I don't even remember the name of these cars, but they were, you know, exhaust spewing East German rust buckets that came <laughs> over the border, you know, with people hanging out and screaming and yelling because they were, they were free to come into the West. Mm -hmm. And so we'd stop and we'd buy them beer and, and talk to them. It was really an amazing time. <laughs> so as far as women mm -hmm. and the women's movement, um, there were, um, it, it was really beginning to blossom, which mm -hmm. was in direct disregard in Switzerland. Really? Because the, the, I had my, I got a contract, mm -hmm. and the next week, the last canton, which is the province in Switzerland, mm -hmm. those women received the right to vote. Really? Yes. This is in the 1980s, right? So 1991. Oh my God! That they received the right to vote. So at the time, being one of the first women, American women, yeah, 
there were women also that I would meet in Spain that asked me f flat out, how did you get out from underneath your husband's thumb? I said, well, I'm not married. I'm actually divorced. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was so interesting to see country to country how women felt about me in the workplace as if I had escaped the tyranny of their husbands in Spain. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, um, very, not really supported, but I was put up with. Yeah. I was a little bit of an annoyance there. And in Switzerland, it, I became quite celebrated because it was such an odd thing. Right. And in America, I'd come home and I'd talk to my friends and they wanted to know, your conductor, what railroad? <laughs> so, <laughs> the disparity oh in cultural... <laughs> Yeah, uh, intelligence was a little bit strange. So how, how long after you started in Germany as a conductor were you named Kapellmeister? Kapellmeister. Kapellmeister, Very thank nice. you. Uh, it, it was uh, in 1991 in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and it was a very big moment for me because uh, all the composers that you can think of, most of them were Kapellmeisters, and that means that in Meister means meist, mm -hmm. ma master, Kapella means the chapel. And so mm -hmm. that came from the old term of the master of the church chapel, mm -hmm. who was the organist, the, the conductor of the choirs, you know, Bach was a Kapellmeister, mm -hmm. you know, who wrote the special masses or whatever mm -hmm. for the special days of the church. Right. And then it became the master musician in town. Mm -hmm. So you went to him, of course, it was a man, for lessons. You went, he did everything in town that was music. He was mm -hmm. the head of it. So to have earned that, it really was amazing for me because it meant that I had achieved certain things like uh, arranging mm -hmm. uh, you know, compositions and able to conduct operas, able to conduct orchestras. And it was, it was a fantastic moment. And you have it for your life. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're a Kapellmeister, they can't take you're it away from you. No. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so, when did your European journey end? That ended. Uh, well, I don't know if it has ended. Mm -hmm. I still go back and work. I work That's in good. Italy and Switzerland at least mm -hmm. once a year. But as far as my career, it really ended the day I picked up my daughter. Mm -hmm. Because I realized many of my friends said, "Oh." You can have, you can do it both. You can have the career, you can have the family. And so I, wait, I had my career first. Mm -hmm. And then I met and married my husband, who was the uh, principal French horn player mm -hmm. in Switzerland, in Luzern, really? where I was conducting. Yes, I, I, didn't I know fraternized. That. Yep, I was his boss, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> See, I'm already very Iowa when I say yep well, now. Well, I, I noticed, he, well, sometimes referred to you as the chef, the boss. So. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> Um, but I, on a, really on a serious note, many of my, of my friends that we came up through the theater system together in all of these different countries, 90% of those women did not marry. Because mm -hmm. you really marry the theater. You marry your profession. And I got very lucky having, had, having been divorced, and then I met Jeff, who was a very nice man and was willing to take on the avalanche of Sherry Rhodes. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> We wanted to have a family, and when we adopted Lily, we, I realized the moment I picked her up that I don't know who's raising my friend's children, the ones that did marry, mm -hmm. but I cannot have a career anymore. And I ditched my performing career, most of it, and went into academia where I taught in conservatories. Mm -hmm. And then we, and then that story morphs into bringing her home to Iowa. So mm -hmm. that was really the moment. And yeah. there are some interesting times I have with women who have not made the choice that I made and biologically had a child and then would be gone four to seven months a year performing. And we often sit at lunch together and we talk about our lives. And I, of course, one friend says, well, at the Met the other day, I saw so-and-so and I was singing in London and I think, I wished I had kept going, mm -hmm. but she wishes that she were home with her children, mm -hmm. so. And so you made that, made that definitive choice. I think that you can't have both, frankly. I think yeah. it's really difficult. Right. Very much so. So um, when you started doing academia then in, um, in Switzerland, did you know for sure that when you went back to the United States, it's what you wanted to do? Did you have any other desires of things that you... Oh, I was so naive. I had this great dream that when I returned to the United States, I would be 
some kind of eminence crise and be able to disseminate all this European culture and history and all this business, and that was absolutely not the case. Yeah. So did I think that I'd be teaching? No. In fact, I was told in the middle of my master's degree, mm -hmm. go away, take off, don't finish. And those were the battle days. Now I know that makes people shudder, but it would be like a professional athlete. It would be like Sean Green deciding, I'm going to go now to the NFL draft. Right. I decided in the middle, they said, you will never teach, you are a performer. So mm -hmm. I left and went to Europe to perform. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I didn't, I never finished that master's degree, but I feel like I have about eight doctorates over. Oh yeah, with, I can imagine, with experience. Life experience, I would say. Exactly. Um, has, it been, has it been challenging here, adjusting to becoming an instructor, to um, letting go of, of um, conducting? Yes, extremely challenging for me, very mm -hmm. challenging. Uh, one part of academia that I did not count on was um, having to speak in English. Really? I had never lectured in English in my adult life. And mm -hmm. so when I arrived in Iowa, and we arrived very shortly before we began, and we all started school the same day. My husband started as French horn professor, my daughter mm -hmm. went to kindergarten, and I came in as vocal coach, cum, diction, professor, all these okay. different things that I do here. And I went with my lecture notes, and it was all in German. And I had to then simultaneously, I realized I had not written it down in English. So that was very scary for me. Mm -hmm. um, as far as not conducting, it's, it, I do conduct a little tiny bit, but not enough. Yeah. And I think with the recent events with the flood, and also the tragic passing of one of our colleagues, Mark Weiger, mm -hmm. I made a commitment to myself to stop performing as a pianist and to put my energies more towards conducting because I think it's where my musical talents really lie. Definitely. Well, things that I can give the students the most, I believe. Yeah, you, have, you had mentioned the flood just now. And the flood. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, a flood. bombshell for the fine arts community, for the University of Iowa community, but in particular that fine arts community. What, how has your job changed? How has your life changed based upon that? Well, you know, we weren't here for the 93 flood. Mm -hmm. So everyone said, oh, you know, at worst you'll be back in the semester. And as we realized that Voxman was catastrophically destroyed mm -hmm. and Hancher, we really, it, we really, I think human beings tend to be in denial on, in things that are so shocking. Yeah. So the arts department moved out to Menards and they have a beautiful situation out mm -hmm. there. Really wonderful. Yeah, it is great. It's wonderful. And the theater department, thank goodness, moved it's back bad. into their building, mm -hmm. most of it except for the basement. Basement's scary. <laughs> <laughs> but we are in, I'm, I teach in a place called the Pizza Room, which would have been the a pizza retail space and there's we it, it's it's not a good situation and mm -hmm. my colleagues we're all trying to do our best we worry about our students mm -hmm. we create way too many projects so that they feel that they are busy in getting this the education they should at Iowa right. because we don't have Hancher we were to have our Hancher or two or, or um, every two years we have them sing a major opera mm -hmm. in Hancher that's gone in clap we have performances, that is gone. Voxman, gone. Harper, gone. We have nowhere to perform. It's tragic for the students, and I worry, as do all of my colleagues, about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see each other at all. My husband's in a trailer. I never thought I'd say that I would be in a trailer in Iowa, but it's mm -hmm. true. <laughs> we don't see our the other professors, which is really important for the community yeah. of musicians to feel the creative spark with each other, and to have other ideas. So for us, the flood has been a disaster. Yeah. And we live it every single day. Um, you said you have a, a show this evening. You'll be playing piano this mm -hmm. evening. Where are you guys going to do that at? Well, <clears throat> in one of the retail spaces that we call the Choral Room. So it's where the, the choir practices. Yeah. And we, it's still filled with boxes 
and they've done a marvelous job trying to insulate the sound from the showers and the bathtubs of the apartments that are above. But really, we need a place to perform. And we I do. know S President Mason has been wonderful, mm -hmm. and I just heard from a representative in Des Moines that they're talking about it. We, we will have something. We will have something soon. Well, I hope that for you guys. It's been on that side of the river as a theater student, it has been. And at least, you know, we, we have primarily our building and our performance spaces back. We weren't hit nearly as hard as, as Hancher and Boxman and Clapp. And it's, it is, it's incredibly hard, especially as you're saying, you want to be able to give these students the same education and the same opportunities that they would have had otherwise. And theoretically, Kelly, we are giving them the same education. Yeah. We do, we're doing exactly what we always mm -hmm. did is just in isolation right. to the rest of the faculties mm -hmm. and the rest of the students. So we don't really have an arts campus and places to perform. And the students have rallied in the most amazing ways. That's great. They just, they've worked so hard and I think that's why we're doing so many extra projects for them because they're hungry, they want this education. That's great. Yeah. What do you teach? I never asked you that before, but what, what classes? What do I, you like to teach? Well, I teach, um, my main job would be to take their opera roles mm -hmm. and teach them the interpretation of that, help them with their languages, with mm -hmm. the diction, and the, the dramatic emphasis. Right. And then there's this other genre that's called art song, and that's mm -hmm. voice and piano. And that's in all the languages. So we go through Schubert to, you know, Schoenberg, whatever, mm -hmm. and we, and all the French and all the Italian. So I work within the languages. Then I teach something called IPA, which is how singers learn to sing in foreign languages without really knowing the languages. Okay. They learn the sounds. And it's like a, a, a diction class looks like a math class. We're always writing these funny symbols <laughs> on the board. And interpretation. Uh, special studies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, there's a question that I like to ask all of our guests, oh. and um, something that I, I'm a big reader, and so um, <laughs> I like to ask our guests to recommend a book to, um, to our audience, um, to all the viewers here, that kind of describes your place in life, describes how you've gained a philosophy in life, something that's touched you, a piece of work that's touched you. Ha ha. I can tell you what I'm reading now, but as far as a book that has touched me, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Really? I think that's a beautiful, beautiful I have book. it, but I haven't cracked it open yet. I only read it this year, and I'm 53. So <laughs> <laughs> a classic. Oh, um, well, the book I'm reading right now is called Salt. It's the history of salt. And you would think that that would not be interesting, but it really goes through the trade routes. And the, the author is very interesting because all wars and all skirmishes had to do with salt. No way. <laughs> it's from the perspective of salt. Who wrote it? I can't tell you. Okay, so it's called I'm Salt. Salt. I, I would look that up. That sounds interesting. I think anyone who has family in Iowa or who lives in Iowa or in the mm -hmm. Midwest should read Little Heathens. Little Heathens? Little Heathens. It's by an Iowa writer. I am so sorry I can't tell you who wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, that's extremely interesting. And it, it explained a lot about my grandmother, who <clears throat> actually was born in Iowa that I didn't realize, and went to the Iowa Normal School to be a teacher, which is now you and I. Mm -hmm. And so we found that I found some things in the book that explained about her and about my mother, who was the main influence in my life. And it explained things that um, about growing up as a farm girl, mm -hmm. which I didn't grow up in Idaho as a farm girl. Yeah. I never saw a potato plant, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> so it's kind of coming back home in some ways when you came to Iowa. Very strange, yeah. Never that thought that would be a circle. Strange how it works out. Yeah. Now, um, so you are um, very close with your daughter. Yes. And um, I, you had mentioned um, in our conversation before, women who had impacted you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to speak at all about your... I, I have been so lucky having um, an enormous influence of great women in my life. I, yeah. I must say, for everyone from um, some early piano teachers and um, a choir director, uh, my mother who was my driving force, and now my daughter. My mm -hmm. daughter is probably 
uh, the <laughs> biggest influence in my life. Uh, she has an, a, an uncanny way to see relationships between people. She's only 14, mm -hmm. but when she's really small too, at three years old, she could go into a room and she could find out that person's relationship with her. So she, I think she'll be probably going more towards therapy. And so in our uh, typical mother-daughter fights, unfortunately, she usually has the upper hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, do you have any departing advice for women on the campus, women who um, maybe were in the spot that you were in, University of, of Southern California, um, but here right now at the University of Iowa, people my age, people um, who are yet to begin their careers, yet to go out to Europe and... I, I do have some advice. There's the idea that America gives us and also why we wanted to bring my daughter back is mm -hmm. that if you work hard, you will achieve your goal. This is distinctly American, because when I arrived in other countries, they, they don't, that's not part of the culture. Mm -hmm. You can work hard your whole life and get nothing. And so why work hard? And I've met people like that. I believe that if you have the mindset, you must work, you must train, if you're, no matter what you're doing, you have to train as if you're gonna run a marathon. You must go towards the goal, because if you don't go towards the goal, you always ask the question, could I have made it or not? Mm -hmm. And I, I could be sitting now in a very different situation and saying, gee, I wonder if I hadn't gone to Germany and lied about conducting, if I would have, maybe I could have been a conductor. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think you have to go after it and, and practice hard, work hard, study hard. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Your story is just fascinating, especially the lie about the conductor. I think that's... <laughs> very gutsy. <laughs> that is very, very gutsy. Now, um, you'll give me a moment. I had another question to ask you, but the last part kind of made the question slip my mind. Um, okay, I've got it back in my head now. That's impressive. <laughs> What's next for you? What is next in your, in your life path? Are you going to stay here? Are you thinking of... My husband just got tenure. Ow. And my daughter's in high school. So you're, you're here I'm for here. a while. <laughs> I'm here. Um, I am going more... I'm conducting Così Fan Tutte in Milano in June 2010. Really? And I'm going to Italy in a few weeks. And so for me, I think that it will be... I'll go more towards conducting. It's much mm -hmm. easier for me to conduct in Europe than it is here. Yeah. I'm I'm older woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a woman. I'm older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an older woman. <laughs> you know, and in a way, I think, too, Americans, I should, you know, you, you, you've you got to have your time. Please. Mm -hmm. It's your time. Right. But um, they don't need my kind of expertise in a way here, in mm -hmm. a funny way. So okay. it's easier. I think I'll probably be going more overseas and guesting as soon as my daughter graduates from high school and told me she's moving to Antarctica to get away from me. Oh, so, really? Yes. <laughs> you know her, Kelly. Yes, I do. <laughs> she's funky. Yes, she's very fun. She is. is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to you wanna talk about? Any part of your story that you want to tell? Um, it was a great life. Fantastic. It still was is great life. Fan it is still a fantastic life. But I really had an interesting career and uh, wonderful memories, wonderful music making, fantastic halls, mm -hmm. great theater moments. Uh, I really feel blessed that I had that and now I can be a suburban mom in Iowa and have a family. I feel like I, in that way, I have it all. I did have it all, just okay. I had to not do it together. So yeah. I know I, I mean, there's so many moments when you ask me that that flash, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I think. Anything that yeah. stuck out to you as a woman um, your favorite moment being a woman? Um, yeah, holding my daughter the first time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and also, I think, um, I think standing on stage and having known that I did a really good Otello, and it was my first one, and it was really good, and I knew every single, every single note, every sing everything that my male co colleagues would never have done, but my mentor told me, you're a woman, you're an American woman, you have Jewish ancestry, you have three strikes against you in Germany. You need to know it better than everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think ha feeling that was a great moment as a woman. And knowing too, and seeing that there are other women now that go and conduct and they go to Europe. Nobody thinks twice about having a woman conductor you're now. You're a pioneer. Yeah, it was a little bit of a pioneer thing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great having something from, you know, 
one part of your life and the other part of your life that really stand yeah. out in the market. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining you, us Kelly. today. I had a great time talking with it you. It was wonderful. It's great. Um, we're very special to have you as a part of our community and have your experience and um, bringing all of that home to Iowa. We really couldn't be happier to thank have you, you here. So. Thank you for inviting me. I of course. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you again. And please tune in to Watch Women at Iowa. Thank you.